Hello and welcome to part two of the Apostolic United Brethren series with Kristen Decker. I'm your speaker Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, and in this part we will be exploring Kristen's adulthood in forced polygamy. Please note that this series contains themes of child abuse and should be listened to with discretion. And now on to part two of the AUB series with Kristen Decker, one of my personal heroes. You've talked about not revealing the plural marriage environment that you are living in. So are you around other children outside of, of polygamous environments? Is this in public school and educational settings? Yes, I went to public school all of my life. And so did my siblings and most of the neighborhood. And uh, we were the general belief was that we were to associate with only people in the call in the group but go to school get educated as much as you can come home and don't hang out with friends don't make friends at school uh, they were all I shouldn't say all because that's not true but a lot of people were afraid of us they didn't want their kids hanging out with plague kids because they we were considered the LDS church evil and bad and doing these wrong things and we considered them evil and that they're going to lead us astray they'll we'll talk if i make friends in school this is what my dad said wherever your friends are is who you want to be with and hang with and eventually if you hang with them you'll want to marry them well you need to stay keep your friends in the group because that's where you're going to marry and where you're going to live and live the gospel so there was this constant division on on um you can go to school but don't make friends don't you know get serious with anybody and I so I was terrified of doing that not only that but if I get close to them they're going to find out I'm a plague so in elementary they knew but then a whole bunch of elementaries go to one junior high school and then there were new kids that didn't know so I was always hoping I could be treated good and people wouldn't know and I'd fit in somehow some way but then they'd all find out you know I should say all but most they'd all and then the same with high school then Several junior highs would go to high school and I'd go, oh, now there's hope. Maybe I can fit in a little bit. Maybe I can be accepted. And uh, and I'll tell you what, that was the hardest part of school. I think I was, a, I'm still very active and I ADD kid, but the hardest part was, was envy. I always envied, like, God, I wish I could be a cheerleader. I wish I could be um in this club or that club I I just envied so many of the girls that seemed to have such normal lives and mine was completely not at all in any way shape or form so that was real tough there's a part in the book early on that's one of these I think funny asides that you go into occasionally which is important because it's heavy subject matter that you're dealing with in your book and it's with you and uh, a friend in school when you're really young and you're bragging to her about having more than one mum. You, you're saying, you know, I've got mums. And she's like, why don't I have mums? And then the next day she comes in school and she is she's saying that she can't be friends with you because your dad's a, pi a pig mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was, was kindergarten. Really funny. Yeah, that was in kindergarten. That was so because I thought everybody normal you know I'm going to public school for the first time I figured everybody had moms you know I have three moms how many moms do you have <laughs> you know that was yeah and obviously polygamist is probably not a term that kids really have heard or understand so she has misheard it and she's saying that your your dad is lives in pigmas <laughs> yes yeah it was really yeah hilarious <laughs> And I say, he is not messy. He's not messy. He can, it was, yeah, it was, it's fun to look back at some of the things we can laugh about. And, and it's yeah, the innocence sure. of children, isn't it? Isn't it's it? A, yeah. Not really understanding the full story and it just being right. sort of like a, and a big deal because she says she can't be friends with you anymore. And, and at that mom age, told her, <laughs> yeah, it feels she like the end of friends. the world. Yeah. She can't be friends with me anymore because he's a messy guy. And I'm going, no, he's not. And I don't get why she really can't be friends because I don't get that there's any issues there. And and until I realize, uh, yep, we're pretty weird <laughs> as time goes on. 
some of the things that you've mentioned in terms of sexual abuse that you encountered at an early age do you feel like this environment where there's an abundance of children and a spotlight on the importance of young female children within plural marriage groups and polygamist groups do you think it really encourages this type of abuse to take place with with young girls at a young age absolutely not and not just the young girls but um as time's gone on it's gotten worse and worse and worse for the boys as well uh but it absolutely is it's an environment that is completely unsafe like I said, I was raising kids and I'm a kid and my siblings are raising kids and there's aunts and uncles and uncles and uncles and uncles all around that have access to all these children that nobody really knows where they're at. I told you about my cousin who I'm helping her raise her kids and she was depressed all the time. I remember her being at my mom's house and crying because she was always pregnant and always depressed and couldn't keep up. And here her husband is the one molesting me and I'm sure his own children. And uh, the, and then the boys could easily carry that on. Some of the girls as well, I'm sure. And uh, the kids, uh, there's just numerous children and a lot of women who absolutely can't keep up. And I was one of those moms as well, who it was insanity trying to be raise my kids and my sister wife's kids and and have them get their needs met and be aware of everything that's going on or not going on everywhere all the time. And so it it is an environment that absolutely sets this up for perpetrators and abusers. And then it becomes the thing to do. I mean, if kids aren't told, and in fact, my friend and I were just talking about that this morning too, is the kids that this happens to are, oh, just just don't do that ever again slap on the hand uh, make sure that you don't touch anybody ever again and then it's gone there's really no consequence there's no education there's no um it, it's it's totally ignored in most cases and then people think well you need to forgive them you need to let go of that resentment and forgive these you know and so therefore it just goes on and on even more it's just Gut wrenching, and there's so many more reasons. But I think a lot of that also is the more that things are forbidden and an education, and there was no education at all, nothing, no sex education. Like I said, with me, I didn't have a clue until I had to figure things out on my own. And there was nothing about being protected either how to protect yourself, what's okay, what's not appropriate, what isn't. And there might be a little bit of that going on, but it's basically just. Don't talk about it because if you talk about it, then that excites people and they, we can't have them going there. You know, that, it's just crazy making. And it's, I'm telling you what, Casey, the abuse now over all these years is so horrific. The sexual abuse, the physical abuse that it just got, it hurts my guts right now, even saying it. It's so crazy. There's a part in your writing where you mention your family being excited for your introduction to the world because so many boys have been born and then you're going to be a baby girl born into the family and your mum's really excited to have another baby girl. And in the back of my mind, I'm just worried about what the older men think that means for them because, of course, as soon as a, a, a girl is born, there's the potential that she might be married into their family at some point. So it feels almost like it's it's predetermined that 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 young girls have almost been set up to be uh, molested and sexually abused from a young age because men feel like they already have a claim over these children before they've even hit puberty. I think you're right in many cases and not all of them. I think that doctrinally it would be you know, sexual abuse is not okay. I think it's just this underlying thing that we've talked about forever and ever. And in the group, I was the cult that the AUB, um, early marriages were discouraged, but that meant I had to wait till I was 16 to date. And then I could, could my dad wanted us girl, his girls to wait till we were 18. 
And we had a choice. That was the difference between the two groups as well, the two major factions, is um, I picked my husband and and most of us did. And the only thing that would have that was crazy making in that part is that we were all related in the Allred group, you're not supposed to marry relatives. That was one of the main things that was the difference between the groups, right? So the AFL, FLDS had already had their huge amount of people, but they're they're not getting converts. In fact, that was one of the main difference. We accepted converts and hoped for converts so we could have new blood. The FLDS were sticking with the main families and main people and intermarrying and marrying child bride marriages. And not that that didn't take place in the AUB. It did, but it wasn't the common thing. And we weren't assigned who we were going to marry. On the other hand, my father being the prophet and or the first in line to become the prophet told two of my sisters that he really, really liked these two, these men. And they would really be good husbands and they could really get you to heaven. And so both of those sisters told me after they divorced that that was partially why they married those men, because they trusted what dad had to say as a prophet and as their father. And he trusted them and not themselves. So they married, they chose men, they chose them. But in the sense, it was because they felt that he had the better information from God and what would be more accurate than what they could choose and do. So the girls, yes, that it, we know, all of us who are in the know of research, that there's as many boys and girls as born uh, pretty much equally into this world. And that's why it, it, this is another insane, crazy idea that there should be plural marriage. And so my brothers and all these men are looking for wives and people and the name the numbers are going down and down and down to younger and younger and younger girls it, it just couldn't be any other way so even though it wasn't accepted in a doctrine that's just what starts happening when the girls are getting married younger and they don't have men to marry unless they're old men and then my brothers all had to go find wives outside of the group and then most of those wives have left because they weren't indoctrinated or programmed since they were tiny and when the when my brothers got plural wives, they were all out of there. They ditched pretty fast. Thank goodness. I'm so glad they did. They I'm really glad they got away. So the time between you experiencing public school and you choosing your husband to become part of a, a plural marriage, what does your life look like in, in those years in between? So I really, so maybe you're thinking teenage years, like early. Yeah. I remember still not having any self-esteem much at all. And I was my drug of choice I realized was a drug was food it was overeating it was junk food it was sugar and I remember my brother would pay me to make cookies and I'd eat them and eat them and eat them until I was sick and um, that of course we realized is satiating all the low self-esteem and the sadness and on and on and and I felt like I was two different people so there was this part of me that was extremely tomboy happy when I was running outside and not having to be in the house and and I could have been even more heavy because of my compulsive eating but because I ran and did a lot of that I wasn't as heavy as I could have been but I remember when I, I think I was about 12 and I was running and one of my brothers in fact the one that had molested me said something about well if you weren't so fat you could run faster and so I went, oh, really? Like, oh, that's it. All right. So I went on this starvation diet and lost, oh my gosh, probably 20 pounds in a couple months. And that, and then all of a sudden I'm getting a trap. The men, these old men are asking my dad if they can marry me. Other boys are hitting on me. Guys at school are asking, you know, me on dates, even though I'm not supposed to date them at all. And, and 
And I, I remember being very confused. So I'm completely invaluable person. And all of a sudden I am like, what does this say? So that, as we know, isn't just a religious issue. This is what women go through all the time is about their appearance or their body is the sexualizing of, you know, that. So I remember being very confused about that. But in the meanwhile, I'm supposed to pick one man that God said I was supposed to marry for all the time and all eternity. And I've got to get it right. And I have no clue how I'm supposed to figure this out, especially when I don't like this God and he doesn't talk to me. And, you know, I, I certainly not. So I remember actually thinking that maybe the FLDS have it right where their prophet tells them who to marry, you know, so maybe, but of course, then I went no way in hell because I'm not going to end up marrying. I won't marry an old man. So I'm just going through all these horribly crazy teenage years. I wanted to run away really badly and join the hippies. My brothers were being drafted and yeah, into Vietnam and one ended up missing there. And I'm like, I hate war. I hate it so bad. I just want to run away. I, nobody's going to ever love me. This is how much self is low self-esteem, but I sure want to have a baby. So I'll just find this cute guy to get pregnant with and, and I'll have, you know, a kid and I'm going to just run away. And of course I didn't have courage to do that. And I was pretty young at the time, you know, to do that. Anyway, it was, my teen years were really crazy. I don't want to be a polygamist. I hate it, hate it, hate it. I've watched my mom, but I have to. If I don't want to go straight to hell, if I don't want to have my kids with me in the eternities, then I have to do this. So I have to find a man who's also going to do that. But the only one that is, everybody in the group are related. We're not supposed to marry relatives. So I've got to find somebody who's not. So I meet this man who's an independent man and we were friends he was dating my friend and I was date he was dating my friend and I was dating his friend they were buds and you know and so anyway we're getting to know each other he proposes to me several times and I thought no you're just you're my friend you know we don't get married you don't marry friends and anyway at some point I'm asking my mom if I can go out I'm on my birthday. I didn't ask her. I told her I was going out. And I think I was 16. And my um, Mark said to me, do you want, well, when are you going to marry me? We were sitting on the couch. This is my friend. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't know. You know, I, we're, we're friends. You know, we just, we're again. So we tell mom, I'm going to go out. It's my birthday. And she starts yelling at me. She, you can't go out. You didn't ask me if you could go. And I didn't mean to be disrespectful. I said, mom, when I've never had to ask you ever, I've just come and go. I mean, like who, I, this is so crazy to me. I mean, why is mom? Well, I realized that it dawned on her the same thing, that she had not been there for me, a parent, because she was doing her own thing and working and whatever. And and it dawned on her. So she took it out on her heartache out on me. and And that happened a lot with her raging it wasn't mean or directed at me after years she she just was raging about in herself and I realized that that's what was going on I went outside and I told him okay I'll marry you and it was literally just like my sister get me out of here I have to have my own sanity my own space my own you know life and this just isn't working for me and it hadn't been for a long long time and not that everything was sad, and and I don't mean to make it like that. I I really had some good friends. I loved hiking and running and going and roller skating and doing very crazy active things, you know, jumping off cliffs into water and doing those very exciting things. But I decided to that he's my friend. Who else, you know, who better to marry than somebody I love and he loves me and um, and so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll marry you. So we got married <laughs> when I was 17. And he doesn't have any wives at this point. Right. I was his first wife. And um, yeah, we, we have to live plural marriage. You know, I'm having kids and and I need to make sure that I can have these kids with me as much as I dreaded it living that way. But that was still what I thought God wanted me to do. 
and that we all had to do. So how long are you together before the first child is born and also before the the, the first plural wife is introduced into the marriage? I, my son was married. <laughs> married. That's great. My son was born. Let's see, a year. We got married in April. So, and he was born the next year in March. And I wanted to be pregnant so bad. I remember when I started the period, just crying because it was like, again, being naive. I, you, I really, when I was a little girl, thought that if you kissed, you were pregnant, you know. But by now, I know that that's not the case. But I thought, I'm having sex. That's it. I'm pregnant. That's that was just a given, at least in my brain. And so when I had two periods, I cried each time. And then and then I got pregnant. And I was so happy and elated. Um, that was just incredible. But he, I think that he and I had a pretty good marriage. He had a temper and we and we were falling in love. And there was the back and forth and like there are in so many relationships. But the biggest trauma was his generosity because he was raised like I was, that you just give and serve and give and serve. And he felt like he had to give everything he made away. And it was gone before he'd come home. And it's okay because we're, we and he and I were raised the same way. We are not, we don't come first before anybody. Everyone comes first before us. It was very selfish to think of yourself, to pay your bills or put food on your own table before you gave to everybody else who's starving or needy or whatever else. So we we had that in common. We were very servitude people. He and I had our fights, but not a whole lot of them. It was mostly just his grouchy if he didn't if he had a bad day or you know things like that. But the tough of part, of course, and I wrote about this is knowing that we have to live plural marriage, and he does so. He's got this right to flirt with other girls and they're flirting with him. And we're like, who's going to be this next girl in his life? And it, oh my gosh, there's no way to describe the pain. You know, that this is, you're watching your husband and other girls just flirting away. And this is, and you're supposed to be happy and okay with this because he's got to get other wives. And um, I wrote, I think, pretty much about those some of those there were several I think often of the girls that he was just crazy about and it looked like they were crazy about but I'm I'm gonna throw this in real quick just like me we were also told that it's better for the young girls to marry old men who already had wives because then you know that they're going to get you to heaven because especially if you're the third wife three is the clincher there then you've got your big toe into heaven. By now, you know, you pretty much got it made. So these girls who often would be flirting with him would end up marrying older men who had wives already. And especially because he was an independent polygamist, that meant he wasn't in one of these two groups I talked about. He didn't follow any leaders. He wasn't raised following any prophets or going to church or paying tithing or reading the scriptures all he was taught it was about living polygamy that was it and so these women were like oh oh he's an independent we can't marry him he's not going to get us to heaven so they ditch you know and this happened several times and then my second cousin had a crush on him and I thought she was absolutely perfect because they had a lot in common and I loved laughter and she was great. She had this great sense of humor. And I thought, okay, if I have to, if I have to accept somebody, you know, and even though it's going to kill my heart and break my heart, at least it, at least I like her, you know, we, and, and we can get along and we can try to get along. So I encouraged him to marry her and he didn't have his eyes on her he had his eyes in other directions and so she got hurt and ended up marrying another dude and that didn't work it was very short-lived that was a crazy cult mentality dude Uh, a whole nother story and um, she had a baby and then left him and then my ex my first husband Mark decided that he should have done that in the first place should have been more attentive and so he started courting her and that was really 
really crazy. Love, trying to love her and accept this is going to happen and yet just being heartbroken. The sex and the dating and all that crazy making that women have to go through. <laughs> eight years, you asked me that, how long? So eight years later, he married her. So you had eight years of marriage in a in the traditional sense? Yes, yeah. But this was always looming over the two of you. So no matter how much progress you made with your friendship, your relationship, with intimacy, with growing your family, with, with you know, bringing children into the world, you always knew that this was something that was going to happen. Do you feel like the most difficult part of being in a plural marriage in that sense is knowing that your partner is being physically intimate with somebody else or emotionally emotionally intimate because I feel they're very different things I think it was both absolutely both I think that the physical part was the most hurtful I have I believe I wrote it in my book and I've said it so many times that I feel like we had a really good intimate relationship by then very we had eight years together and we had worked on so many things together emotionally physically sexually everything and um, I feel like that it was never going to be the same. It, it just, it's completely different. I talk, I have these conversations with my kids and grandkids now where sex is the first time you date and sex is, you know, just for fun. And it, it I, I can't even picture that because for me, it was intimacy. It was this ultimate connection of making love it wasn't just sex and so when she got married to him I thought I was gonna die of heartache yeah it was just heartbreaking and uh, as you can tell still hurtful we still continue to have good sex but it still wasn't the same because there was always 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 and I know women I've talked to many women and men especially the women who are going to always from now on compare he loves her more he has sex with her more he's you know he'd rather have sex with her more you know always always this constant um worry about does he love her more is he gonna would he would he run away with her and leave me uh you know all the insecurities that come up on both sides do you feel like there are instances where perhaps you don't feel like being physically intimate with your husband, but when it's your allotted time or scheduled time to be together, that you really have to force yourself to be in that position with him because you you feel like you need to be keeping him as happy as possible so that he doesn't favor the other wives over you? Oh my gosh, Casey. <laughs> I'm just blown away. That was one of the best questions ever. Uh, that is really good insight. It absolutely, absolutely felt that way. And as you know, he's passed away now. As my ex sister wife and I are have become good friends. If we have time, we can talk a little bit about that. But we've compared notes, and and all the whole time, I'm thinking she's got to feel the same way I do. You know, if she doesn't want to fight with him because he'll come to me and I don't want to fight and blah, blah, blah. You know, they, the women have these same similar feelings and you bet exactly what you said. There were times like, oh yeah, if he wants sex, I'm having sex because there's, because I need to be just as much loved and just as much, you know, giving to him. And that's why where men get spoiled rotten, they, because all the wives want his love and affection and attention. And even though it's hard on them, and we need to address that too, really hard on men who are good believers, but, and good men. But uh, it's, it, those men, I mean, I remember my dad in his later years wandering around looking for food because now his wives have all made their own lives and they aren't childbearing and they don't care about sex anymore. And he's starving to death. Because they used to make him the best meals in the whole world. And I'm sure they all wanted to sleep with him. And he had it made for, you know, as far as being spoiled. So, yeah, you're right on on that. Whether that's sex or conversations or whatever, kissing his ass. That's what you do because you want to be fa not in necessarily favored, but at least equally loved and or favored. Yeah. That is the end of part two of the 
Apostolic United Brethren series with Kristen Decker. Part three will look at Kristen's continued adulthood in forced polygamy. To find a link to Kristen's book, 50 Years in Polygamy, please follow the links in the episode description. To get early access to ad free full length episodes, please visit patreon.com forward slash the cult vault. And to get in touch with me, you can find me at cultvaultpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at cultvaultpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, host of the Cult Vault Podcast.